Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome inside episode 424 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains on an Ottawa Senators game day. The Senators hosting the Vegas Golden Knights. A team who just made a superstar trade but are without a few superstars of their own. No Max Pacioretty. So no breakaways, I guess, against Ottawa today. No Mark Stone, no William Carlson, and the list goes on and on. The Senators, however, will face likely former goalie Robin Leonard, who's absolutely dominated the Sens since leaving in that 2015 trade. We'll get into all that full preview coming up of today's game, and we'll also get back to one of our favorite segments, our Sens Central Citizen. Luke Skinner will join the show. We'll ask how he became a Sens fan and a whole lot more. All that plus the Belleville Senators back in action and, well, it didn't go their way. We'll touch on that game as well. This is the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day. Today is Thursday, November 4th in Pilsy. Breaking news. It appears that Nikita Zaitsev will be a healthy scratch in tonight's game. Oh my God. That's the biggest news around the NHL today. That is <laughs> wild. I mean, obviously DJ Smith listens to the Locked On Centers podcast. We've been we've been talking about this for a long time, but that's uh that's a big move. So what who slots in for him? How how are we looking here? I'm I'm not aware. Kyle Bukoskis tweeting this out exactly one minute ago. We're recording okay. at 10 30 a.m. Eastern time. And the decor looks like this at the morning skate. Shabbat Zoop staying together. Then Mete, Josh Brown, and Del Zotto with Nick Holden as the third pair. I mean, you got to try it. That's the thing. So hat tip to DJ. He's not letting the contract and the veteran status kind of get in the way anymore. I think it was for a while. But, like, here's the thing. Like, how many in the video room when they're going over film? Like, how is DJ being like... Oh, yeah, don't worry about that Zaitsev play. Ooh, this next one, yeah, that's fine, Nikita. Like, it's all good. Like, eventually, like, it's staring you right in the face, and it's like, okay, yeah. pretty clearly the problem here is Nikita Zaitsev. So, it doesn't, you know, it's not a it's not a detriment on him. It's just, hey, sometimes, yeah. you well, sometimes you need a break, though. Like, if you're overwhelmed and obviously things are going your way, you need to take a step back. Try something new. Watch the game from above. See see if you notice anything different. Take Get a healthy break. Maybe he's banged up. I don't know. So this is a good thing. And I'm glad DJ Smith. This is what I like about DJ Smith. There's a lot of times where you can look at him and be like, oh, man, he's just being a stubborn old hockey coach that's following the traditional rules. But eventually it seems like he does give in. You know, he's got... He, he can break. He doesn't just bend. He can break if need, and he can change how, what he's doing here. So I think that's a good move, and it'll be refreshing to see an Ottawa Senators team without Nikita Zaitsev this season. Really telling, though, the fall from grace from a guy who was yeah. named to the leadership group just two weeks ago, and now after nine games, he's got no points, minus six, and his, uh, his shot share numbers are absolutely brutal. Uh, five on five, he's on the ice for 41.7% of the shot share. So you look at all those things together and his average ice time, You, I'm not going to say that I could see this coming. I thought Josh Brown would be able to line up before Nikita Zaitsev, but this guy averaged 22.44 last year, 22.09 the year before. Those are his two seasons in Ottawa. Pilsy, through, through nine games, he's down at 17.15. So wow. the message was sent that he's already five minutes below his average from last year. And obviously playing Shabbat has, with Shabbat has a lot to do with that. But to me, this is long overdue because the game has just not matched the contract for a lot longer than this season. But especially this year, the mistakes are just uncanny. Like the, he's, get, he's putting grenades on guys' sticks. I was on the Smitty and Mitty show, this show out of London uh, last night. And I, I said that when he makes passes, he's putting grenades on guys' on guys blades. It's not smooth on the tape. So maybe going upstairs can help that. And I really hope so, because if Nikita Zaitsev is a better player than he's shown this year, 
safe to say the Sens are a better team. So the, the immediate reaction is that it's about time. Is it not? Yeah, exactly. And and the thing with Zaitsev too is this, it's really terrible that this is happening now because this is probably the last year they need Zaitsev. And um, isn't doesn't he have a no move or there's some his signing bonus? There's some sort of part of his contract that makes it very apparent for the Sens to trade him now. So they need his stock to go up so that they can get a good trade value for him. And uh, clearly, that's not what happens. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get great trade value anyways. Uh, he does have a modified no-movement clause, but has had it since coming to Ottawa. Uh, he's got a 10-team no-trade list, but I think his contract extends that list far past that. He does, <laughs> however, have a $2 million yeah, signing bonus to do this offseason and next. Uh, whereas the Senators acquired him right after Toronto paid a $3 million signing bonus. So Ottawa had him for $1.5 million in the first year, $4.5 last year, $4.5 this year. And although that is the cap hit, the last two years, as I mentioned, are $2 million each in signing bonus. So that's the future uh, for Nikita Zaitsev, but the present will be press box, and that's where you can find him tonight. So the Senators' D pairs that we mentioned already, Shabbat Zub, it's – Listed here, TSN 1200 has Delzato Holden as the second pair. I would probably agree that's going to be more likely the shutdown pair. And then Mete with Josh Brown. Now, some great news. We, we're looking at different jersey colors, right? That's how you figure out Zaitsev odd man out. Well, guess who's back at practice today, Pilsy? It's Shane Pinto wearing a non-contact yellow jersey. How important is it for him to get back in the lineup here as soon as possible? I don't think there's a single player that's injured right now that's more important, or even anywhere on the roster. The Sens. I, yeah, that's what I mean. I was yeah. going to say you got Mark Stone at a lineup coming to town, Max <laughs> Pacioretty, William Carlson. The list goes on better than all of them. All right, <laughs> um, but the Sens they need a second line center here because as we're uh, talking and looking at these lines, look what's happened to Tim Stutzla. He's now down mm -hmm. on the third line with Tierney and Ennis, which is fine. But it's mostly you could because, argue that's a two A two B situation, though. Definitely, but the the Especially ice when you time, have the Maurice Richard candidate Chris Tierney in the middle of that line, <laughs> yeah. But the ice time is going to be affected, right? Because Brown and uh, Nick Paul, we know yes. DJ Smith loves those guys, so he's going to be putting them out more. So, however you want to rank him is fine, but the ice time will be affected there, and it's because no offense, to Nick Paul, but he's not a centerman that can really get Tim Stutzla going. I think Stutzla can work with Brown, but as Paul, and he's not a natural centerman, Nick Paul, I would say he's a better winger. So to have him not only play center instead of wing, but also be a more defensive kind of physical center rather than a playmaking puck moving guy, I think it's harder for Timmy to adapt. So now that moves Tim down the lineup and sure, he's going to be put with, uh, there we go, with Tierney and Ennis who suit him more. But he's also going to be playing less, which makes it a little bit harder to get in the groove and get that first goal, that monkey off his back. So I think Pinto not being here really shifts this entire team's dynamic. It really does. And isn't that crazy to say about a 20-year-old yeah. centerman? Like, who only has like a handful of NHL games. Yeah, well, 11-3-1. So you do the math. When this guy is in the lineup, the team is a whole lot better. And I'm glad you mentioned Stutzla and Formanton flipping spots. I think this could be as much praise for Formanton, who's yep. on a two-game point streak and has looked really good over his last three, four games. And I think he does kind of suit that Paul Brown mentality a little bit more. They, of course, all combined on that great Nick Paul goal, the tip-in against, um, I almost said Dallas, against Minnesota on uh, on Tuesday evening. But what this also does is it'll allow the creativity of Tim Stutzla to gel with Tyler Ennis, yep. who's third on this team in scoring. And, of course, I mentioned Tierney. Five goals. You kidding me? Hmm. You kidding me with Chris Tierney? This guy's on fire. But those guys all together, and, of course, Stutzla will get his extra ice time on that first power play unit that was so good against Minnesota. You just hope that you get a better start tonight. Hey, eh, Pilsy? Like, we'll get into a bit of a preview right after our Send Central Citizen, but – on the fourth line, I mean, not a whole lot to say about that, although it looks like Logan Shaw out, Dylan Gambrell back in. So this will be the first time we get this set up on the fourth line where it's Gambrell with Zach Sanford and Austin Watson. Your thoughts overall on how this uh, little bit of tinkering is going with today's lineup? 
I was very surprised to see Shaw come out of the lineup, Ross, because we talked about his face-offs. And he took, if I remember correctly, I don't have the box score in front of me, but I think he took like 16 draws or something last game. Like, they were really relying upon him. Now, his numbers dropped, obviously, with more face-offs. I think he was around 44% or something. So, he, with more usage, he wasn't as effective, but that's going to happen. But for them to take him out of the lineup was surprising for me. I wonder if this kind of hints towards him going back down to Belleville, especially, like you said, Pinner's on the ice practicing again. So, that's going to be interesting. But also, I do want to see a little bit more of Gambrell. He's kind of been a neutral guy. Like, he hasn't done anything amazing, but also he hasn't been an eyesore and made any dumb mistakes either. So with a little more time, and he's coming to, I mean, a new new country, new team. So it takes time to start gelling again here. So that's something that I'm going to be looking for. And I want to see him kind of make an impact, like get a couple shots, win a couple faceoffs, like have some sort of positive impact here. So I'm going to be watching Gambrell for that because I think that's a that's a good fourth line. Like I know that sounds hilarious to say, like we got a good fourth line, look out, but... Sanford really, like on paper, he shouldn't be a fourth liner. He scored hey. 16 goals and he's a Stanley Cup champion. Like he should be a third liner. So having him on the fourth line should be good. Gambrell is a guy that lit it up in his junior years and plays a good defensive minded game, good fourth line center. And then Austin Watson is your prototypical fourth line right winger. So really, that's a nice line together there. So it should be effective up against other teams' fourth lines. And if you're wondering who starts in goal, Philip Gustafson is in the starter's end, so Ooh. you'd love to see that as well. Of course, we hope Murray's uh, doing well health-wise. You never know what's going on with him, but uh, that they're carrying three goalies right now. And, and I mean, Phillip he made Gustafson. it through a game, so that's, there you go. that's improvement. Absolutely. So we'll have a preview of that game coming up after. But first, let's get to our Send Central Citizen. It's been a while since we've done it, but you can bet it will continue. And speaking of betting... I need to get back on my horse because it has been tough sledding for me as well as Pillsy's Parlay of the Day. It is tough times. Do you hear we had the Sports Equinox, 25th ever, this past weekend where MLB, NBA, NFL, and hockey were all going? Well, that's come and gone. The World Series is over. But you can still get your licks in with the NHL, NBA, and NFL. So head over to betonline.ag and our friends there want to give you a 50% welcome bonus. That easy, just because you're a listener of the Locked On Podcast Network. So here's how you go about it. Go to betonline.ag and put in the promo code Locked On. That's promo code Locked On for betonline.ag, and you'll just get 50% of what you put in. Bingo, bango, bongo. You put in $200. Boom, that's $100 right in your account. So don't sit on the sidelines anymore. Get into the action, and don't forget the promo code Locked On to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. It's Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, here he is, our Send Central citizen. It's Luke Skinner. All right, we now welcome this week's Send Central citizen. We're going back to basics. It's a long time since we've had a friend of the show on. It's Luke Skinner. You can go follow him on Twitter at LPB. Skinner, Luke, welcome to Locked On Senators. How's it going today, man? Not bad, guys. Thanks for having me. Really oh, excited. It's, it's yeah, it's a long time coming. We got to meet you at the home opener. That was awesome. Well, let's start there, man. What a what a start to the year. Up three nothing over the Leafs. You ultimately come out with the win. What was your experience like? First time in the building in like two years. Oh, it was awesome. Like, it was just exciting to see the crowd and like actually a decent number of fans show up. And the I think the best part was just. For some reason, the entire crowd decided that Zoo would be chanted like, every time you touch the puck. And that wasn't discussed before. Like, that wasn't planned. It's just like all the fans just love the guy and just realize that we have to chant his name every single time he touches the puck. And that was just such a fun time. Yeah, I mean, Zoom Nation stand up really took a literal sense at that point. And yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad he knows that we're not booing him. So that's uh, yeah, good I was worried about that, that cleared up too. Yeah. And hey, Luke, this is a cool experience for us because finally we've met a Sen Central citizen in person and oh. then have them on the show. So we're, we're stoked to have you here. And how about that atmosphere of the home opener? Like all these fans have been so deprived of hockey. It's the Battle of Ontario. They get up three nothing in the first period. Like, how stoked were you that that's how the game started? Like, that, like, you must have been on cloud nine with the rest of us, eh? Oh, yeah, it was great. Like, I hadn't felt that atmosphere since, like, our last playoff run. Like, yeah. it hadn't felt like that in that building. And I went to a few of those games. and It was fantastic. 
And I actually, I went with uh, my cousin, a buddy and like, uh, I guess, future brother-in-law and he's a Leafs fan. So it was a, a fun experience. Yeah, he's from over in Napanee. So I guess it's not his fault. I can't blame the guy. But uh, <laughs> I always take him to go see Leafs games because it's, it's, it's a fun experience just to see his face get like more and more depressed as the game goes on because even though they're way better, we always beat them. So Yeah, especially on home ice. Eh? I'm trying to pull up. I had the stat there. I think it's like 15-3-1 yeah. and one in the last 19 home games against Toronto. And that goes way back, but I'm sure your fandom goes even further back. What uh, What's your yeah. origin story? How did you become a Sens fan? Well, I actually became a Sens fan through my grandmother, which is like not the traditional way to do it. I think um, before I was born, but my mom bought uh, my grandparents like, a pair of tickets like pretty early on in the uh the new team I guess and uh they went and they both fell in love with it my grandparents but especially especially my grandmother uh they'd take us to games they ended up getting like partial season tickets as well and um she'd get pretty into the games like really into the games there's one time after uh sends loss to the Leafs at home that she uh was walking out and heard a Leafs fan being a bit too uh I guess bragging a bit too much. So she just ran up behind him and gave him a big old body. Nice. And, uh, and he, she shut right up. He wouldn't, he wouldn't say anything else. Hey, is she a right shot defenseman? Maybe, he, maybe we can get her on the ice for the sense here. <laughs> Damn. Um, she also just like loved Alfredson like so much, like to the point of like fault, like just no matter what, it's just his hair is perfect. That was always what she was talking about. Like if it was buzz cut, it was perfect. If it was long. It was perfect. Like, there, there'd be no problem with it no matter what that man could do no wrong like, praise alfie perfect perfect player yeah and like he was just like the, the best leader like even um she was diagnosed with cancer a while back and uh he somehow figured out about that and figured out she was a fan and he sent her like this framed autograph no picture of him yeah with like a little bit of like a little note written on the on the frame which was super nice wow that's and, awesome uh, yeah she uh she ended up beating that but she was diagnosed later as well and um it was like when they were pushing for a playoff spot and even though she was super sick she decided to take like this huge huge long sheet like just like gotta be like over 100 feet long and and wrote go sends go on it and put it on the front of her house <laughs> and I don't, I don't know how this happened but somehow uh he got like sent a picture of that so he wrote her like this long like handwritten note uh like it was it was super nice it meant so much to her and um i guess like that passion was sort of passed on to me and my cousin and uh when alfie left like i know a lot of people were sort of like i don't know some people were kind of upset about it there was like some animosity and stuff but he did like more off the ice for us than like he ever did on the ice and at the end of the day that's really what what it comes down to like it's just a game but that's what it's all about yeah, wow, that's a, f a phenomenal story and uh, one that just shows kind of these these players off the ice, what they can do in the community that really elevates them from star on the ice to superstar legend. I mean, the guy's got the key to the city and for good reason yeah. too, being able to touch so many lives. So I got a feeling that Alfie's number one in your heart as well. But if you go back to when you started becoming a Sens fan, who are some of the other players that really jump out in your mind and say like, that's my guy? I loved Ray Emery and I there can't explain go. why. Like, I don't even know why, but I like, I think I wrote him a letter at some point. I forget <laughs> like how old I was, but I loved Ray Emery and like, I don't know, Phillips and Neil, right? And okay. Felino, I like Felino a lot too. That's solid, man. Ray, Razor's my favorite goalie all time. The guy just had that so swagger good. in goal. Hey, he was, yep. he was always yep. raring to go. Um, so yeah, some great memories of the past, but now in this team right now, right? You're in stage two of the rebuild, apparently. Uh, what, uh, what's I thought the rebuild was over. Oh, right. right. Hey, well, yeah, the rebuild's <laughs> over. Come on. Over. So what would be your next move? Let's say you're DJ Smith. I know Pillsy likes to ask this question. I'll get, I'll let him ask the more macro one, but what's your next move? If you're DJ Smith, how do you get these guys pushing for wins rather than, uh, this skid they're on right now? Like immediately, immediately call, call Brandstrom up. Immediately. All right. Like, wow. I don't care that he's not doing great in the AHL. Gus sucks in the AHL too. Like it's just a different <laughs> league, right? Fair. Like you can't really compare the numbers too much. He's not an AHL player no. and uh, call him up. And I, I know like the D is a temporary problem because we got some guys coming soon, but that's not going to solve all the problems. Like Sanderson will be good this like next year, 
but he won't be like amazing. And JBD is going to take some time. Thompson, who knows, but you need some, somebody for now, like someone to come in and be able to be solid now. And I don't know, maybe someone like 25 to 30, a bit more experience, but no one like, we can't just keep every year getting two absolutely terrible vets to throw away later and say it was a mistake. Like you can't just like, you own your mistake, then you do it again year after year. Like, what's the point of that? So I, I get some, um, I know that's not DJ's role, but they got to figure out how to, how to get the defects because there's nothing DJ can really do about it at this point if, if he's only working with losers. So if they do call Brandstrom up, who do you play him yep. with? Because then this becomes a problem. Do you yeah. want to split up Zub and Shabbat? Or no. do you see? Yeah, so then now do yeah. you put Brandstrom with who? Zaitsev? Zaitsev has been a revolving door of terrible partners that hasn't worked. And then, I don't know, maybe you could get him with Nick Holden. That'd be all right. I mean, they uh, I don't know if they actually did cross paths in Vegas, but they're both uh, former Vegas yeah. uh, players. So maybe there's some, some chemistry there. But yeah, what's your plan if you do call Brandstrom up? Oh, I think... Probably Nick Holden, I think. You give it a try for a game because I know Branstrom, like they've tried him on both sides and stuff, but you got to set him on one. But I'd, I'd try him with Holden because then you have probably two solid like pairs, right? Because Zubin and Shabbat are stellar. Yeah. And Holden and Branstrom would be like probably, probably good. I think it would work. Hopefully out well. good. They can't be yeah, worse I, I, than I, what we got. Yeah. <laughs> based on like how they play, right? Like I think it would, it would be a good, a good duo. Yes, Holden's going to be able to like hold the line and stay back, and Branstrom's going to do his thing, right? So, despite that maybe being a little bit further down the road, I don't know if I see Branstrom coming up in the next game or two. If yeah. DJ Smith continues on the path that he's on coaching this team and everything seems to, you know, grow a little bit, but maybe nothing drastic changes, do you think this team can push for that last playoff spot, or are we still a year or two away? I think they could push, but they need a few things to fall into place. Not even just like player wise, but luck wise. Like you need most of the players that have been iffy to step up and you need Gus to, you have, you have to play Gus, honestly. Like Gus will play well if you play him. And that's what, that's, what's important. I, I know there's a problem with three goalies and Gus is the one on a, on a two-way contract, but like, if you don't play him, it just shows you don't want to win this year. And that's, like really what what it comes down to but yeah you need Gus to play well and you need uh we need Pinto back ASAP because yeah. look at the stats with Pinto and without Pinto it's night and day you need Pinto to be healthy and come back and you need Brady to get back into, into form he's really close he's super close like you saw last game he had some some shines of, of, of skill there but yeah you just need everybody to step up and um you need uh Delzato to I don't even know <laughs> not play or play better or uh, Zaitsev to sit or I don't know. Yeah. There's that's the, that's the thing. The D is just such a complicated problem. That yeah. The D is a mess. The solution. Now yeah. I want to, I want to get into something you touched on though, is the goalies, right? Like yeah, hearing three goalies, it's a tough thing. Teams have tried to do it, but then no one's getting enough ice time. But the thing with the senators that's different than most teams that try to do it is Matt Murray is a wild card, right? Like he might be healthy one night. He could be healthy for half a game and then you're, you're stuck. So do you think the Sens will continue to move forward here in uh, with three goalies here? Or do you think something's got to give and either they send Gus back down to the AHL or they try to sneak Forsberg through waivers? Yeah. So I think Murray's here to stay Yeah. Um, for a couple of reasons because they've invested a lot into him and no one's going to want to pick that up. Right. Um. Gus, you have to play him, in my opinion. You just have to. So I'd go with Gus and Murray and Forsberg. Like, I know he might not slip through, but I think he would, because he's he's like an NHL goalie, but he's not incredible, right? Like, he's not someone that will get picked up immediately. But I know that is still valuable, and I'm hoping that if they do try to send him down, that he does slip through, because you can't you can't do this for the whole year. Yeah, and I they've said like. Like Gus's contract is it next year or the year after where it goes to next one year's way? one way? Okay, so like he yep. they have bet on him, right? Like he is the future for goalies, definitely. If if not in like a starter in a backup position, right? Like he is going to be that. Why not just give him like a head start, right? If he's playing like like a starter, like he's playing like a real starter right now. Oh yeah. So 
why not just give them an extra year and start them now? I do the same, but yeah, you're right. In practice, especially if you're a goalie, right? Three guys, two nets, something's got to yeah. give here eventually, or yeah. you're not going to get enough reps here to be ready to go. Speaking of ready to go, you're heading to the game tonight, man, against a depleted Vegas yeah. team. You fired <laughs> up again. We talked about being in the building. Now oh. you're, you're back in there and uh, I'd say Ottawa's got a pretty good chance to win today. What are you hoping to see from the boys? Final question for me. I think that they have to win tonight. Like this is a, sort of situation with uh, like the penguins and the leafs right we got a leafs, must they, win game on our hands here when Luke they lost Skinner that calling game a must the, win to the ahl penguins and the leafs lost that game it was a, a pretty brutal sign and we're honestly playing a team that's just as deep as that like he got none of your star players and he's lost another one in the, in the trade for eichel so and he's not going to be here till four or five months so this is a must win game and this could turn like the tide a lot because we've only had like one bad game i'd say yeah. everything else has been like close or whatever at least competitive but, yeah and I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that like if the Sens play a competitive game tonight they'll win like yeah. if if you don't play a competitive game you'll lose and if you do play a competitive game like you'll win like we're not gonna be walking out of this game tonight like oh we should have won that like we were so close because if you show them our strength and like speed and skill they got no chance no chance yeah, I agree. I mean, that forward core is really weak. The D core is still good. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. It's going to be a tough test for there sure. So Luke, we want to thank you for coming on as a Sense Central citizen. Like I said, it's uh, it's awesome to have met you in person and now get to do this. And uh, hey, enjoy the game and make sure you're cheering loudly. We need you. Oh yeah, we'll be, uh, we'll be calling you out next time we're in town. We got to get back together here and cheer on the boys. So thanks again for joining us, buddy. Really appreciate it. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Stick to after Luke for joining us. Really great to get back to our Send Central Citizen segment, eh, Pilsy? Oh, yeah, that was awesome. And like I mentioned, it was just weird to actually have met him in person and now do this because we've been doing this mostly over COVID time, so we haven't had that opportunity. So that was awesome. And how about that story about his grandma with uh, Daniel really Alperson? I mean, captain shit right there, right? Yep. Like, it's you're a leader on and off the ice. You respect the the fans that love you so much. And all it takes is a little bit of effort and you can make someone's day and you can make a lasting story and create a Sens fan through generations. Like that was a generational fandom thing that happened, not not entirely, but a big part because Alfie was willing to go the extra mile there. So that's the kind of stuff you love to see. And uh, shout out Luke for sharing that story with us. Really does show how sports can bring people together like nothing yeah. else. So we, we love that, uh, that Luke was willing to share that with us. And we appreciate it. If you see Luke at the game tonight, tell him what up. Yep. Cause he, he'll be there. The senators hosting the Vegas golden Knights. And would you have believed me if I told you before the season that Ottawa would only be one point behind Vegas already nine games into each of their season Ottawa three five and one record of course they haven't done well in the last few games that one one and one on the road trip whereas Vegas they come into town with a four and five record and last time they were in town they had just fired their head coach yep. they replaced uh, Gerard Gallant with Pete DeBoer this time they just make an absolute I was gonna say highlight real blockbuster that's a word thank you trade they have acquired Jack Eichel and a third round pick in exchange for Alex Tuck, Peyton Krebs, a first, top, top 10, 10 protected, protected, and a second. So what are your thoughts on the trade? And then we'll get into tonight's matchup. Well, first off, I think initially people say it's a weak trade, but everyone needs to be reminded, this is how trades for superstars go. Like, you don't trade a superstar and get a superstar in return usually. Like, almost never, unless we're talking about, like, I don't know, even that's not a great example. But at the time, like Callahan for St. Louis, straight up, right? That was kind of a, all right, hockey deal here. Whereas this, there's so much more to it. And you have to understand, like Jack Eichel, this is a guy making $10 million for the next, I think he has four years left. He's had serious ankle problems. He's still working out a neck injury that won't have him recover for, I think you said it, three to five months or something, right, Ross? And They're then hoping that he's back on the ice in four months practicing. Yeah, so that's still a long time till he's here. And Sucks. He's going to miss the Olympics. Yeah, well, I mean, for Canadians, that's, uh, that's not, not, yet, true. not the worst o thing. Open, but, open uh, spot at forward at the U.S. too for uh, maybe number nine in Ottawa instead of, uh, I don't know if he's going to wear number nine in Vegas, but he wore it in Buffalo. Yeah, so that'd be all right. And 
Also, Buffalo has like no leverage in this situation, right? Everybody knows they got to move him. Everybody knows they can only do so many moves. Like only so many cup contending teams can fit $10 million in salary into their team without ruining their roster, right? Which Vegas was able to do this. Tuck is already injured. And the only roster player they lost was Peyton Krebs. And Vegas doesn't give a crap about prospects anyway. So they're not really too concerned about that. So I think... If you're the Buffalo Sabres, really the big win here is you didn't retain any salary because you still have to deal with that Jeff Skinner contract. So you can't really be retaining salary and paying Jeff Skinner $9 million to score 10 goals a year. So I think that was a big win. And it's just this dark cloud is gone. The sun is shining in Buffalo now. They don't have Jack Eichel looming over them. And I, I'm a big fan of Peyton Krebs. I think he can be a big deal. And you start looking at their center depth now. You got Cousins, Middlestat, and Krebs. Like, if those guys pan out, damn, that's a nice one, two, three punch down the middle. So, if you're the Buffalo Sabres, and then you get guys like Jack Quinn, uh, they've got uh, guys coming up the pipeline here, too. So, if you're the Buffalo Sabres, I think you made out okay here. The, the main thing is, Jack Eichel was never going to play another game for them. So, they had to move on and they had to get something. I think they did okay here, where I think they really, well, I guess it doesn't matter too much, but. Top 10 protected seemed a little a little aggressive for me. How many, tra- I mean, as Sens fans, how many trades have we seen where a team goes all in and then that first round pick ends up being a top five pick? And especially with Vegas having most of their core injured long term. And like you mentioned, they're similar spot in the standings as the Ottawa Senders. So that pick could be a good pick if th- things keep going down uh, and this snowball keeps rolling here. So I think... It was an interesting trade. I'm glad that it's over. Now, all the speculation's done. I'm sure Jack Eichel's uh, stoked. And it's it's so on brand for Vegas. So this trade really kind of makes a lot of sense here. Do you think that it takes a little bit of the focus away from tonight's game? If you're in that locker room, obviously this, the talk is all going to be about their new acquisition. Not really, though, because your new acquisition is not available and you you've lost a roster player right so i don't i don't think it's going to have that effect if anything it's well i don't know yeah we'll see what kind of effect it has because it doesn't have a direct impact whatever impact it would have would be like a mental impact right so that's going to be interesting to see but ross i don't know if you've looked at the the vegas forward lines here where like the sends are basically going up against uh the henderson silver knights forward group here like Dadnov and uh, Smith and Marsha show are kind of the oh, only Dadnov team. revenge game. Yeah, Daddy revenge game. Look out. He's going to be playing with so much pace to just to show oh, DJ oh, Smith oh, oh. what he can do. But uh, yeah, those are about the only three NHL roster players playing for this team. Well, Chandler Stevenson is actually pretty good. I shouldn't cut him short. But other than that, it's pretty damn thin. So Ottawa, if uh, just, I know I'm jumping ahead a little here, but my key to victory for the Ottawa Senators is to dominate in the neutral zone. Like where the defense core is still very much intact for Vegas in the neutral zone when it's mostly these guys like, yeah, Nicholas Roy, top top centerman, Will Carrier is uh, on your second line there. So I really want uh, Ottawa Senators to dominate in the neutral zone when they should be going up against a weaker forward group here. How about Micah Matteo? Another revenge game on our hands here. Just picked up on yeah. waivers from the Toronto Maple Leafs. So a pair of former Ottawa Senators here. And if you're listening to the podcast, wherever you download yours, it's uh, Nicolas Roy. Pills a little en français on there. Uh, uh, in between Jonathan Marcheseau and Riley Smith. Chandler Stevenson between Will Carrier and Evgeny Dadanov. The third line, Micah Matteo between Keenan Kolasar and Matthias Janmark. At least they got Janmark back. He was on, was on the shelf too, and he's a decent exactly. player. Exactly. So. And then on the fourth line, Jake Lasition and Brett Howden. Not sure if they're going to go 11-7, but the decor looks like it's going to be Nick Haig and Alex Petrangelo, Alec Martinez and Shea Theodore and Braden McNabb with Dylan Coughlin. That's a now, solid decor stick. That, it's still solid. Now, in goal, we expect that it'll be Robin Leonard. And if that's the case, Pilsy, do you still think after all these years, Robin Leonard gets up a little extra for his games against Ottawa? Absolutely. I would say he probably gets up for these games more than anyone, even though it's been so long. Because he... Uh, and now, I'm not sure where he was at uh, with his off-ice um, situation. He said, quote, I was a shit show in Ottawa. So... There you go. So, like, I mean, both sides maybe uh, play some blame here why things didn't work out. But I think he definitely feels like he could have done better in Ottawa and that maybe 
they shouldn't have shipped him off to Buffalo. I think he's probably holding a little resentment for that. But um, he's a guy that definitely plays with emotion. So he definitely is going to be getting up for these games. It will be his 15th game against the Ottawa Senators. He's 8 0 and 3 <laughs> with a 939 save percentage and a 184 goals against average. He's got one shutout in there as well. And just looking back, I mentioned the last time Vegas and Ottawa played against each other. It was a 4 2 Vegas win in Ottawa. That was the Mark Stone return game. Uh, his first game back in Ottawa, and uh, da -da, he had a goal and an assist. Shocker. Marc-Andre Fleury picked up the win, and uh, it was uh, Craig Anderson who made 39 saves on 43 shots. But Pilsy, that's not even the worst. If you go back further to when Vegas and Ottawa first played last year, Anders Nielsen had made 52 saves on 54 shots. Oh, my shots, God. I forgot about that. And it went to a shootout. It was a complete beat down and it was a five round shootout marcia so ends up winning against ottawa however thomas shabbat in that game scored his first goal of the year now that was in the sixth game shabbat although playing very well still looking for his first goal he's my locked on player tonight i think that he breaks that goose egg a nice cannon from the point here i, I got thomas shabbat score and what's your locked on player and then we'll get out of here as we head into a senator's game day well, I, I don't want to go back to Formy, but I just want to do an honorable mention of Formy. Okay. Getting second line minutes is, is a Noted. big deal. So I'll, I'll kind of go back on what I was saying before. My locked on player is going to be Gambrell because I want to see what he can do here with, with Pinto getting more healthy. Like his spot is kind of in jeopardy here. So, and I'm not sure where Clark Bishop is uh, in this process, but I'm sure he's got to be getting closer here too. So that fourth line center job and Logan Shaw, they haven't sent him down yet from what I know. So He's still vying for that job as well. So Dylan Gambrell, he's got to make sure he's making it worth DJ Smith's time to keep him in that spot. So he's going to be my lockdown player tonight. And your lookout player for me, it's got to be Evgeny Dadnov, <laughs> not to take the low hanging fruit, but I need to see what kind of pace this guy is playing with in his first game back in Ottawa. Yep, that's definitely a good one. I'll give you that. Uh, for my locked on player, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with Nicholas Haig. He's okay. someone that I, I've been very interested in. He's a big shutdown defenseman, and he's getting to play on the top pair with Alex Petrangelo. So, like, obviously Vegas is saying, like, hey, kid, we are we might not trade you. We might actually keep you instead of trading a first round. Uh, uh, yeah, he's a first rounder, isn't he? Yeah, they, uh, early second, I think. Early oh, second. Okay. So a high-end prospect, uh, so we might actually keep you here, so let's see what you can do. But he's a guy that I'm always interested in because um, having a big shutdown young defenseman like that is is so worth it. So I'm going to be watching him. So we start the day, news of the day with Nikita Zaitsev, healthy scratch. Turns out he's somewhat healthy. And uh, I knew DJ Smith wouldn't just take him out of the lineup just because he's absolutely brutal. Although yeah. all fans are ready to. Uh, the quote is, there's a cold thing going around. And Zaitsev isn't 100%. So he is That's out. Fair. And Holden comes back in. Shaw comes out. The umbrella goes in. They said they'll announce the starting goalie tonight. But Gustafson, again, was in the starter's end. So the Ottawa Senators are 3-5-1 and one on this young season. But they're back on home ice where... They're two and three. So can they get back to 500 at the CTC? We'll discuss it tomorrow morning. We also are joined by Gord Wilson from TSN 1200. Goody's going to stop by and take us into the weekend. We'll ask what it was like being in the United States for the first time in almost two years. Checking up, Check in on him. If you didn't listen, the last time he came on was on his 50th birthday, and he didn't even tell yeah. us. We had to find out. So this guy's an absolute beauty pills. He can't wait for that. Oh, yeah. I mean, Sen's legend. And every time we've had him on, uh, it's been a blast. He's a lot of fun. and uh, Great storytelling. I was going to say, we usually get a good story or two. So definitely look forward to that. Stay tuned for that and more. But for today, we say goodbye. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators Podcast, your team every day.